Let's talk about why the Syrian president has been getting VIP treatment in Saudi Arabia. Bashar al-Assad's been welcomed back into the Arab League, 12 years after Syria was kicked out because of his violent crackdown on protesters. That crackdown turned into a war that's decimated Syria. The UN reckons more than 300,000 civilians have been killed. Around 14 million people have been forced to leave their homes. That's more than half the pre-war population. And Assad and his regime are accused of carrying out some of the worst atrocities. So for years, he's pretty much been isolated internationally. But now it looks like things are shifting. The admitting Syria into the Arab League is very much a symbolic move for Syria and for Assad himself. It also, you know, gives credence to his narrative that he has won the war. This normalization sends a very clear message that you can kill your own people, you can gas them, you can besiege them, you can detain them, you can destroy your own country, but you will still be welcome. So what's going on here? Why is this happening now? And what does it actually change? Now, before we get into those questions, there's some background we need to cover. First up, what is the Arab League? It's basically a regional club. Right now, including Syria, there are 22 members. It was set up in 1945. Its stated purpose is to promote cooperation and stability in the region, but it doesn't have a great reputation when it comes to actually getting things done. It hasn't been involved in solving any of the crisis or the problems that the region um, have been through for the last 70 or 80 years. So Syria being welcomed back isn't really significant because of what the Arab League does, but it's a sign of Assad's diplomatic rehabilitation in the region. After years of being an outcast, he's back in the room. Now, something else to keep in mind when we're talking about Syria is that 12 years of war have left the country divided, although Assad controls most of the country with the help of his allies, Iran and Russia. The war has reached a kind of stalemate, with zero sign of any political solution. And that helps to explain the Arab League's decision to readmit Syria. Mainly driven by the consensus that is in the region that Assad is not going anywhere. They understood that the Arab League um, and Arab partners need Assad back in the Arab League more than Assad really needs that. Now, this shift in attitude didn't just happen overnight. And there have always been some differences in how Arab League countries deal with Assad. For example, Oman, Sudan and Algeria never cut ties in the first place. The United Arab Emirates restored diplomatic relation with Assad's government back in 2018. Bahrain and Jordan followed soon after. But earlier this year, there was a turnaround by Saudi Arabia, and it looks like that's what made the difference with the Arab League. In May, Saudi Arabia said it would reopen its embassy in Damascus, and the League voted to let Syria back in the club without any conditions attached. Not all members were on the same page, though. Qatar, for example, said that its own position towards Assad hasn't changed, even though it wouldn't stand in the way of the Arab League's decision. Now that's all the diplomatic stuff. And for millions of Syrians who suffered so much from the war, it's been hard to watch. It was very sad, it was very painful. It felt like a betrayal. On the 2nd of July, 2013, my father was kidnapped by the intelligence of the Assad regime from our um, family house in Damascus. My dad was a, was a well-known critic of the regime. I spent the last 10 years of my life wondering if my father is um, still alive. And my family and I, obviously, we had to flee the country immediately after my father's disappearance. And then, you know, another journey started off. We had to, you know, rebuild our lives from, from scratch. And now you see him welcomed by everyone with the red carpets and he has the stage to give a speech and preach us on what happened in Syria and to flip the narrative, the truth of what has happened is very, very, very painful. Now you're normalizing the, the, the war criminal who is actually responsible for everything this country has witnessed. Okay, so how do we explain what's driving all of this? Well, there are a bunch of reasons we can point to. 
Let's start with Saudi Arabia. Right now, it's super focused on developing its own economy, and it seems to be pushing for more political stability in the neighborhood as a way of supporting that goal. This is all part and parcel of this de-risking strategy by Saudi Arabia to create a political environment in the region that will not interfere or will impede in any way their ambitious economic project. So for example, we're also seeing the Saudis trying to get a peace deal in Yemen. And they've recently been patching things up with Iran, their long-standing rival. There's something else to consider about where Iran fits in. Remember, it's one of Assad's main allies. And some of the Arab League countries may be calculating that getting closer to Assad could help reduce Iran's influence in Syria. Because, you know, the Iranians have gained a major foothold during the civil war by coming to the aid and assistance of Assad and ensuring his political survival. Then there's the issue of refugees. Arab League countries like Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq have taken in huge numbers of Syrians, and it's been a heavy burden. They're keen to start sending some people back to Syria, and establishing closer ties with Assad may help with that too. Whether the refugees themselves feel they've got anything to go back to, or whether they feel safe about returning while Assad is still in charge, those are separate questions. There were no conditions put on the Assad regime to do the necessary economic, political, and social reforms to actually allow those refugees to come back. Syrians had to flee Syria because of the Assad regime. So as long as this person is the ruling what is left of this country, Syrians will not return. Now, another thing Arab League countries are hoping to get Assad's cooperation on is Captagon. It's an amphetamine-type drug that's causing problems in the region. 80% of the world's supply comes from Syria. It's said to be the country's biggest export, bankrolling Assad's government and war effort, although Assad denies that. This has been the economic lifeline to the Assad regime and to the businessmen and the constituency surrounding the Assad regime. In the Middle East and Mediterranean, the Captagon trade was worth almost $6 billion in 2021. Saudi Arabia is one of the biggest markets. It's become a popular party drug there. Jordan has other reasons to clamp down on the Captagon trade. The main issue is not the drugs itself, but actually the weapons being smuggled by the same networks um, into Jordan. So whether it's Iran or refugees or Captagon, there are different reasons why Arab countries are keen to start dealing with Assad again. But it's all a bit unclear still, and there's no actual plan about what might come next. The Arab League Secretariat has been very clear in that one, there has been no preconditions on the regime. Two, they said there's, there are no plans. There are actually um, understandings of the issues that needs to be addressed. But there is no agreement yet on what this roadmap would look like. And while this has been going on, there's been no change from the US and Europe when it comes to Syria. Assad and his regime are still under sanctions. So that's going to limit how Arab countries and companies can deal with him. They read the international scene and their companies are aware of the kind of sanctions that can hit them. Now, if they were to do that, will the Biden administration basically turn a blind eye to, to, to that, you know? I don't know. It all depends on basically what the Assad regime is going to give back. So here's the thing. On one level, you can see how Syria's readmission into the Arab League probably won't make much practical difference anytime soon. But the symbolism is a big deal. For Assad, it looks like a vote of confidence. It's important for his narrative that he's spinning at home inside Syria that the road to religionization of the regime has started. There's also symbolism in what Assad's comeback represents when it comes to the Arab Spring, the pro-democracy uprisings that swept the region 12 years ago. It's kind of like closing the chapter on the Arab Spring. From the Arab leader's perspective, there is a need to close this last chapter of an opportunity for democracy and a representative government in the region. Regardless of whether Assad controls 10% of Syria or 100% of Syria. We spent the, the last 12 years of our lives learning, unfortunately, the hard way that um, Arab governments or any other governments do not really care about, you know, whether Syrian people want freedom or deserve freedom or they have freedom or not, you know, on a political level. I think this is, to me, it feels like the end of, you know, the, the beginning of the end. 
There are a lot of changes happening in the region right now, including possible peace in Yemen. Watch our recent explainer on that, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of Start Here.